Good morning, church. Good morning. Yes. Five, ten. Oh, thank you, Chef. Let's pray before we start. Father God, we are here today because we are here in our earthly journey. And we know that this is not our permanent home. We know that we have a promised land. So it all begins right in Egypt, where you have guided the Israelites and also us to wherever you are going to take us. So thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath day, and may we be blessed for what you will remind us today. Amen. Can you hear me, folks, over there? Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, I had this a little bit this way because I could. Okay, so um, I am going to lift you out of your chair today. And for a minute, or no, actually for 30, 40 minutes, uh, you are going to travel with me through your imaginations to the land of Egypt. And um, that's where it all began. And the Exodus is a history, right? But today I'm going to try to make relevance of that history to my own personal journey and to your personal journey. So today I hope this will make a relevance to all of our lives. And I was just privileged to go uh, the first two weeks of June this year and went to Egypt. So um, here is our anchor verse today. So Exodus 22, I am the Lord thy God, who brought you out of Egypt from bondage. So here it is a journey of the Israelites who entered into Egypt for 430 years. Can you imagine that? 430 years, and that's in Exodus. By the way, I'm going to relate all of this, and the chapters are from Exodus, Exodus 1, chapter... Exodus 1 to 20. So that's where our reference is going to be for this morning. So, and then also from the patriarch of prophets. So we were privileged. There were 53 of us who went to Egypt. And Pastor Don Maketosh, how, how many of you have heard of him? Heard of him? Uh, he's from Weimar in Central California. And he related all what the relevance of our trip until we went to the promised land. So, um, next slide. Okay, so the Israelites' migration to the land of Egypt, how did the Israelites ended up in Egypt. How did it all begin? Right? Tell me. Um, Jacob was named Israel, and the father of Joseph is Jacob. And so it all started where the Israelites um, multiplied in the land of Egypt. But what was Egypt like then? It was all about, in our travel, I was so in all, not really about what these idols are all about or these statues, images, but it's how they um, left history in that land to reflect what was Egypt in the ancient times. And so you could tell by the glory of Egypt what they did. They were building a lot of this sphinx. I felt like I was an ant standing in front of that sphinx. Um, this humongous. Behind that is the, um, what do you call it, the pyramid. And the pyramids are, they call them the pyramids because it is the final resting place to eternity. 
okay? And that's what they did. They thought that they could really preserve the person into eternity. So you know what they did? They mummified people. They would bleed them with all the fluids from the body, and then they would um, then dehydrate them. So of course, they're decomposed. Then they put them to under those sphinx and under the pyramids. So then they thought they could preserve them there, right? But um, that was just a practice. I don't know, there's not really much burial inside there, but they would bury their dead there. And then they would make all of these little idols that they would put the top of the burial. So, for some reason, they thought that even those pharaohs of old think that they could be eternalized, right? But no, God has, God knows better what Egypt would become. Okay, so that's, all right. So, oh, I went back. Okay. All right, so Egypt, so let's, let's just focus what Egypt was. Why did God bring Israelite to Egypt? Well, it was a glorious time in prosperity. It was the place, like United States, the place of freedom. Then Egypt had what? Bountiful. The you know, people came to Egypt because there were famine all over the place. And when you see the desert over there, you can think, how did they survive with this arid desert? But anyhow, that's what Egypt was then, the land of Pharaohs. So when you got into the airport, they say, welcome to Egypt, the land of Pharaohs. And I thought, what is that all about? Well, it was all about power. So they built mosques. This is the mosque of Muhammad Ali Shah, not the boxer, right? Muhammad Ali Shah, that they had a lot of mosques, beautiful mosques that they built. And then I took this picture, but I hid myself. <laughs> this is what we call animus. Egyptians like to worship animals. So you know what they did? They would put the heads of animals into a person. Uh, they worship bugs. They like frogs. Remember how Jesus had, or how God gave them those frogs during the plagues? Oh, they like the frogs. But can you imagine every inch of frogs in the land of Egypt? And then, this is in the valley of, um, what do you call the valley of kings. Look how small the person is, and look at all the statues that they have built. Because then, the pharaohs and the Ramses were the most powerful, and they didn't think that they were God. Okay? So they think they controlled everything. But yet, they worshipped God's created things, like the animals, and, and, and the bugs, and the creatures. But everywhere we went, they have animal um, representation of men. And I brought you something from Egypt just to illustrate. So I don't know if you can really see it. This is a person, right? But here is, on top of his head is a serpent. On top of his head is a bird. On top of his head, what is that? Uh, it's a bug. Okay? So they had made those creatures great. And so what happened to the Israelites? Well, they were multiplying, of course, because uh, Joseph had how many brothers? Eleven. Yeah, and so the tribe grew, and that's where they multiplied. So the Israelites living in Egypt for 430 years, and in the desert, how many years? 40 years. So can you imagine generations of Israelites? So. I'm just saying, and they were thinking that then it was their glory and they were worshipping uh, animals, but yet they thought they were the gods themselves, especially the pharaohs and the Ramses. Okay, so it all began with Joseph right here, right? He was uh, what? He was sold and brought to Egypt and enslaved. But then, through all his sufferings, right, he had a lot of crucibles. Uh, through all his sufferings, he was sold, then he was in prison, then he became a governor. So he became powerful in Egypt. But God gave Joseph the wisdom. When he was governor, he knew 
where the Israelite would be situated. So when during his time, he was a friend of the Pharaoh, right? But after his time, and after those Pharaohs died after his time, they were already very cruel to the Israelites. So Joseph knew where the best land of Egypt was, where the, uh, the Israelites had thrived. Okay. All right, so, so this is where Joseph asked the Pharaoh, King, I want to have Goshen. I want my people and my tribe situated in Goshen. So Goshen looks like this. Uh, by the way, this is the Nile River. You see the reeds over here where Moses was kept? This is the place where, um, yeah, where the princess, uh, the daughter of the king. This is an artery of the river that flows out where they can have their vegetation and fertile land. Okay, so they were irrigating uh, the Nile River into the inland part. So from here in Cairo and then Goshen flows down the, river, the Nile River and then um, Goshen is the land of plenty. So these were mosques and houses. They have like three levels of houses. And of course there was abundance and it said, I will bring you to the land where there's milk and honey. I, I wonder what is milk and honey. So if you have fertile land, what will you have? Cattle, correct? Who produced the, the milk? The cattle, right? And if you have fertile land, there are green vegetables. When we were passing through, there's a lot of vegetables there. And because there's the bees that produces the honey. So Joseph knew where to go and, you know, have his people situated in the land of Egypt. So God gave him the wisdom to go to where he should be. And okay, now I just want to show you the geographic. I want to, to show you the geographic route of the Exodus because this, were, this is where we travel. So here is Goshen up there. You see the blue arteries, call it the veins by the way, where it flows to the Nile River right here, okay? And in here were the pyramids, and then this is Memphis. Memphis, by the way, when you went, there was a lot of those images and uh, stone hieroglyphics that our um, uh, tour guide said, it is in these stones that told us that the, Egypt, I mean the uh, Egyptians made the Israelites uh, slaves. And there they suffered from a lot of, what, what were they doing that was so, what did the Bible say? What did the Israelites were doing when Moses sold them? They were making what? Bricks. Bricks without straw. straw. So this is where in the land of Memphis that the Israelites were noted to have been slaves. So then, um, so if you can see, this is where they traverse, okay? The first route is from the northern part over here till the junction of Israelite and, uh, what do you call it, Jordan. But the second route is the central route from uh, Ramses or Goshen. Then they move over here, pass into where uh, junction of, of right here in Jordan and the alternate route. So they were wandering for 40 years, another alternate route till they crossed over uh, the promised land. And then you have um, another route where you see, this is where mostly they had traveled because right here is the Sinai Peninsula. Where, you see this? Mount Sinai, Mount Sin, which is actually the holy mountain where um, Moses met with who? God, and, and he was instructed to um, where the Israelites should have uh, survived. And then right here is Rephidim, right? Uh, Rephidim is where when the Israelites cried out to God, Lord, give us water. And they were brought to Rephidim. When they were so excited of the water, when they tasted it, what happened? 
pastor. It was bitter. Okay, so they were desperate for water. Now, it just made me remember that right now we are in a water flood. Crisis, not just shortage, but crisis. When I went to River Jordan, the uh, Lutheran uh, priest there said, I am very sad because Jordan now, instead of being a wide river and the source of all our uh, economic and, and financial and our, our vegetation, can, can you believe uh, Jordan River is not just about two meters wide? Okay, just two meters wide because of having them irrigated and also the, the sun scorching hot. It was so hot when we went to Egypt and Jordan. And so they, they were desperate of water. Could it be that we too can be desperate of water? It's here for some reason because of what's going on in our climate. So can God make it happen, you think? We'll see. But anyhow, that is where Mount Sinai is. We went to Mount Sinai, and then of course, this is the Red Sea. The Red Sea has two main arteries here, and this is called the Sinai Peninsula. And this is where they cross uh, the Red Sea. But then the Israelites felt trapped because when they were trying to get out of Egypt, what happened? That's where, what? They were apprehended by the Egyptians. So there were, of course, thousands of um, Israelites who were happy to get out of Egypt uh, to freedom. This is the desert where God, in a way, they went to Kadesh Barnea, which is up here, that gave them better, not bitter, but better water source. So that's where they were able to thrive. Now, the Israelites wandered for 40 years. Now, what do you think uh, happened here? Now, we're in the desert, right? Why did you think God brought them in the desert? Why in the desert? To see what's truly in their heart. Yeah, the weather can be harsh, too cold, too hot. But it is nothing in the desert, although we have more here than the desert. Even now, when we went there, there was nothing in the desert. And I look at it and I thought, how could have Israelites, especially near Sinai, how could they have survived there? But you know, what did God do? They, he provided what? Their basic needs. What? Water and light and manna. Correct. And so there are also something else that God provided for them. Quails. Quails. So in the aridity of our life, picture this. In the times where we are in our own desert, what has God really come forth for you? What has he given you to supply your need? Now, let me relate to you my own personal story. Um, I left, I lived in La Molinda for a decade and a half, right? Before I came from LA to La Molinda. And then I said, Lord, and I was, um, I was fired. I was, a, I, I had an administrative job. And I said, Lord, take me where you want me to be. But I want to live near the beach because that's where I want. And you know, when, you, we, when we pray, watch out, he'll say yes, no, or I have a better plan for you. So God had a better plan for me. He brought me where? Right here in the desert. Because I had a job there. I said, wherever you bring me, or the first job acceptance, that's where I'm going. And when I got here, just like the Israelites, I murmured. I said, Lord, why here? It's so boring, it's so dry, scorching hot. I love LA. I love, you know, the, the place down the hill. We call it down the hill, right? So, um, so, but then in the desert, God provided their basic needs, right? It didn't say their cars or houses. Basic needs, only tents. So picture in your life where you were desperate. And so when I got up here, I had a job. But my husband did not have a job. And then I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to do here, Lord? I, I'm short. What am I going to do here in the desert? Maybe I should go back down the hill. But anyway, to make the long, to make the long story short, he provided for me no matter what. So I'm sure you could find, if 
you close your eyes in the history of your life, the desert where you were found wanting. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, the wanderings of Israelites. So they were there for 40 years, right? They revolted, they were hard-headed. Um, and then in that peninsula, where, uh, what do you call it? That Mount Sinai is, which is the holy mountain where Moses met with God and he got instructions. Uh, these were my uh, co-travelers who went to the summit of Mount Sinai, which is about 8,000 to 9,000 feet. And they had to leave at midnight to catch the sunrise. And there they rejoiced that they caught a sunrise and they were on uh, a donkey, not donkey, camels. Halfway, you would ride on a camel, and then halfway up, you climb to the summit. Did I go? What do you think? Did I, I go? I hope so. Yeah. No. I did not. I was scared. I thought, I have height problems, and I said, Lord, forgive me. I'm here in Sinai already. At least I can see the tip of the mountain. But they rejoiced that they could be there. And something that every Christian, I think, would feel good to have seen Mount Sinai. And there I felt like I wanted to see two things in Sinai because there was a cathedral down there. So the Greek priest who was uh, watching the cathedral, I asked Isis, is there a replica of the, two command uh, the, the Ten Commandments table? He said, honey, that's been broken and nothing has been preserved. And I said, another thing, how about the tabernacle? Because those are the two major things that happened, right? Uh, in in their wanderings right there, the Sinai Peninsula. And he said, well, there is no tabernacles, but if you open the Bibles that was in a museum, big Bibles, this big, tiny Bibles, this big, they were all in a way to show what the Israelites did in uh, Egypt and in, in the Penin Sinai Peninsula. So, all right, so what about the wilderness. Well, all of us from Sabbath school and from last week's, it even talked about Egypt, the wilderness of our trials, our temptations. What trial have you gone through in your Christian life? Can you thank God for whatever it is? And if you are brought into your knees or even into your tears, was he there for you? Was he there to listen to you? You know, when we wait so long, and there is a lot of verses in the Bible, it says, wait patiently on the Lord, right? Wait patiently, because He's going to try you. He's going to put you in a refiner's fire and grind you until you can feel Him. Because that is all about, I give you the trial. The more we have trial, what happens? With the more we can what? Especially when you're in pain, the more you are closer to Him. Because you pray to God, my uncle, who was not SDA, I mean, who left the SDA church. He was in a lot of prosperity and houses and bought 7-Eleven. I don't want to talk about Bible and SDA. But when he had cancer, then he remembered God. And he lost his 7-Eleven and then he said, now I know why he brought me here in America. How many of you are migrants in America? Migrants, okay? Now, I say the word migrants because migrants means we are moving from place to place. So, many of us here migrated, correct? From the Philippines or from Jamaica, we came over. But an immigrant is a person who moves to a place and lives there permanently. Now, let me ask you, are you an immigrant here or are you a migrant here? Immigrant. Huh? Immigrant. How many say immigrant? How many of you are migrants? How many are not thinking? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right. What did I say? Migrants are moving from place to place. Nothing permanent. That's where they wandered, right? In Egypt. And then to the promised land. An immigrant is going to a place permanently. Now let me ask you, who said you're an immigrant? Is this your permanent place? Oh, 
Um, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> For now, it is all temporary, correct? So, we are all migrants here. Where do you want to be your destination is? Heaven. Heaven. Not just Canaan or Israel. Canaan, by the way, is Israel now. Not just there. Because you know, that place is a lot, even with all where God sent Israelites. They don't believe in Jesus. And there's a lot of what? Fighting. That's why Jesus said, when he was resurrected, he says, peace I live with you. Not love. He said peace because he know among his people, the Muslims, and the Christians will have a lot of fightings and war there. So anyhow, uh, temptation. Yes, we do have our temptations here. Right? Who doesn't have a temptation? Who is perfect here? Okay. <laughs> and then, uh, in our unfaithfulness, sometimes I waver, waver. I said, Lord, do you hear me? Do you really want me to do this? How come you haven't answered me? And then I wouldn't know, I doubt him, right? So we have gone through, I'm sure, of these times where you question God. So in the wilderness, what did they do? They were distracted. Ah, let's have some fun. Let's have some glee. Let's build a what? Golden cup. Yes, a golden cup. So when Moses was talking with God in the mountain, uh, when he came down, what happened? Aaron made this. He was so busy making that golden cup. And then that was also Moses crucible, thinking that they were being obedient to God and listened to his, uh, you know, commands and all that. By the way, I took a picture of the burning bush because that's where in the bottom of Mount Sinai, we went walking. Uh, I said, there must be a burning bush here. So I was in quest for the, uh, the table of Ten Commandments, the tabernacle and the burning bush. Well, I'm down here, I didn't show my face, but this is a burning bush. We have a lot of that here. So this is where God said, what? Moses, this is a holy place. And then who, and he said, who are you? And he said, God said, I am that I am. I am Jehovah. So in many of our times, sometimes we have to encounter God. And sometimes he will show us, maybe not talk to us directly, but show us and maybe in his own guiding, you will understand that he was there all along. Well, there was a joke that when you go to Israel and to this land and area, a man said, how can I access God if he was here and was here all along? And the local said, just dial him, his local. He will answer you. Anyhow, um, I wish I had seen God in that mountain right here where the cathedral was. This is where we stay. You see the green right here? These are grapes. So even if it's so arid and dry, God provides what people need and they have good grapes. I have never tasted the sweetest watermelon, but it is in Egypt. It is so red and sweet. So um, that is part of the section of Mount Sinai, and uh, that is where we stayed right here. And in Mount Sinai, I said, God, I know this is just halfway of the journey. Where can I have that journey? Can I go to the promised land? Can I be in heaven? You know, I had a lot of questions, but I knew that I was just trying to figure out and try to feel the presence of God. Okay, so then, okay, so in the promised land, they had a dead end, correct? Remember how they were wandering around? And so the Israelites know that the that the pharaohs and the, the, the captains were, what, after them, trying to apprehend them. Have you ever felt apprehended in your life? Did you ever have an enemy that just would not let go, right? Uh, people that harass you, people that put you down, and then put you on the lowest level of your life. Uh, that's where the Israelites were so afraid. And in the Bible it said, they were so afraid, but God said, fear, thou not. Let's say it together. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. Yea, I will uphold you. Right? So in this place, um, this is where the Israelites felt trapped. 
Uh, by the way, I took a picture of uh, the Red Sea. Actually, in the daytime, it's so blue and serene. We made there. It has nice temperature and golden sand. Uh, this is the Red Sea. So I asked, I asked the local. I said, why did they call it the Red Sea during the Bible time? He said, no, actually, in the banks of the Red Sea are plants that are reeds. You know those reeds that was in the Nile, uh, Nile banks? But in the sunset time, look what happens to the, the Blue Sea. It became the Red Sea. So then um, Moses, of course, what happened? You guys know, have you seen the Ten Commandments? You guys, have you seen the Ten Commandments movie? Where that Red Sea parted for the Israelites? I thought I had goosebumps. So when I went there, I thought, this is so wide. How could have Moses led these Israelites and and God parted that all the way over there. But then I also saw a section of the Red Sea, which is not so far, and then the, the distance is closer. So I thought, it must be here that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. But then even here, they were so afraid because the pharaohs and the captains with their chariots, uh, uh, Egypt has a lot of chariots artifact, that um, they were apprehended, but then God gave us the miracle of all miracles. And and even with that movie, when I saw the Ten Commandments, I thought, great. And when I go to Red Sea, I still cannot even imagine. But you know, God knows better, right? So I thought that would kind of help you imagine why it's a Red Sea when you get just back a Blue Sea. Okay, then finally, after we crossed the peninsula, we got into Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is where? What, what was significant in Mount Nebo? That is where Moses had his final destination, right? So we're talking about journey and destination. This is the Mount of Nebo. I was so happy to get there. I thought, boy, I'm here. So I'm sorry, I, I put my picture here. I tried to hide myself from all these uh, pictures. But this is Mount Nebo, so we climbed Mount Nebo, and up there we saw it says Mount Nebo Sehagia Memorial of Moses. And there I felt for Moses' leadership, and I said, wow, Moses really sacrificed a lot, right? But there I felt sad for Moses, because he journeyed with the Israelites, with all the murmurings and the trials, his own crucibles. He was only up to the Mount of Nebo. And God said, here you can see only the promised land. And some, some of the history uh, data says that's where he died, or that's where his life ended. Not really, they said. He, was, he just saw that mountain, and then he looked over the promised land, and then they made a monument. But he was buried in the valley, not in Mount Nebo himself. But this was, uh, people there would go up and there is a nice sanctuary or a cathedral. They make a lot of cathedrals in Europe. So this is a monument where Moses' work was done. And when you think of our life, could it be, where could my life towards, uh, my, end, my life here on earth end in this journey? But I felt sorry for Moses. He did not see the promised land, right? And in spite of the fact that he led them through. So that's Mount Nebo and the significance of uh, the destination of Moses. All right. So then uh, the promised land where Joshua, from, so from Mount Nebo, Joshua took over to lead the Israelites into Canaan. And so if you Google, and I Google this, the division of the land, uh, a promised land to the 12 tribes of Israel. So right here is Israel, right there. And if you can see, there's the 12 tribes from Manasseh, Reuben, uh, Benjamin, uh, uh, who else? Um, all of the, in Judah, and all of the uh, 12 tribes, uh, the brothers of uh, the tribe of Jacob. So they were able to reach the promised land. Uh, the Israelites did, in spite of that rough and humbling journey for 40 years. 
This, by the way, are pictures of what Moses saw uh, for the for the promised land would be. And of course, now Israel was very developed. This was the arid land and the desert in the times of Mount Nebel, uh, when Moses visited to Mount Nebel. Okay, so what is the significance here? What actually happened there? And how can we relate to that journey in our lives? So it happened 1446 before Christ, that long time ago. And in that journey, there is a section, there's a theme and event. So if you look here, there's a section for this grid, a, a column for the theme and the event. So what does this mean to us to make relevance and parallel of our life? It says, um, God sees his people Israelites. That's us. Wherever we go, whether it be in the desert, in the beach, or in a, in a nice place like, how many of you have been to Canada? It's so green and a lot of water. Canada is one of those uh, countries that has a lot of water. And then, um, Israel going towards Sinai and God travels with his people. So, is he with us? Definitely. He's with us every day, every moment. And then Israelites at Sinai right here, and then God using Moses' instructions. So God chose a leader. That's why we have a pastor who can lead us. And by the way, our ultimate goal here, our vision here, is to build a church one day. So a uh, memorial um, to our, uh, so that we can advance the message of Jesus Christ. Now the theme is that mainly, now it is very personal. Is my redeemer and my salvation, right? A rescuer, the supreme king, control over his creation, not the animals, but the Israelites. And there, the Israelites felt that redemption and they celebrated the Passover feast. So they rejoice because God has with them and pulled them out of Egypt. So again, God is our provider no matter what. Even though there's so much distraction here, we become in our own golden camp, we become uh, so distracted with our houses, our homes, our belongings, our materialism. Uh, God knows how to provide us even in the basics. So in the desert, he gave us manna and they guided him in a light of pillow. Now, how did, how did the Israelites know that God was with them? How did he speak to the Israelites then? What is it that uh, in the Bible that said, I am with you? How did he give them a sign? Pillar of cloud. Pillar of cloud, yes. And then the lightning and the thunders. You know what? We haven't had rain so much. And one today is supposed to be lightning and thunder. And when the lightning and thunder happens, thank God, maybe rain will come, right? So that was how God talked to them. He said, I will have a cloud over you and I will, I will show you signs that I am there with you. So he's the provider of our need. He's the king. He's just and merciful. So it said, the Bible said, you are a merciful God in our travels along the way. So if God was not merciful enough, God would have destroyed the Israelites, right? Because they were what? They were like us. Disobedient, hard-headed, distracted, make idols, right? So God wants to personally relate to us. That's why he will give us crucibles and trials and temptations. So why do you think God brought them to the desert? Ah, there is not much entertainment in the desert. It is dry. So God thought, I will confide you in the aridness of Mount Sinai Peninsula. So, uh, so he wants to relate with us. Maybe we can be quiet and just solely depend and submit to him. Okay, events. It started with God saw that for 430 years, Israelites became slaves. And they were oppressed and God thought the Egyptians are my enemy. So I am going to show them I am powerful. God hears their cry. Have you ever cried to God? How many of you have cried to God? Yes, yes. 
You know, and when you cry to God, you are so close to God. And we have, when we have so many problems here, what is our tendency? To look up, to talk to Him. But when we are so busy because we are wealthy here, America is wealthy. It's hard to convert people here. Who needs God? Yeah? Because we have everything. Who needs God? But anyhow, uh, but God hears your cry and save. Save us. Thank you, God. Uh, one time when I was traveling from a place to a place and rode a, 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 a big boat, a vessel, then it went this way, right? And I thought, oh my goodness, not yet, God. I'm still young. I'm in college. <laughs> Don't let me die and, and, and sink with this boat. And I cried to God. So Israel, through God's miracles, the Red Sea party, God delivered them from the plagues and showed him, showed them that he is more powerful than the Pharaohs and the Ramses. Because it was the Ramses who, Ramses too, who were the most cruel among those uh, that um, uh, treated the Israelites. Okay, of course we grumble against God and Moses. And God meet his people in Mount Sinai to be close to him, to grow closer to him. And then another major thing that happened right there in the peninsula, the Ten Commandments. Number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why was that number one? What did he see in Egypt? They were having a lot of idols. They were making those animals. Everywhere you see imprints of animals, head of a cat, head of a lion, head of a, a, a bug, they call it kar karaka, something like that, and the animals, and even frogs. You go to a store, there's a lot of symbols of frogs. That's why God gave them the frogs in that play. And then people build golden calf. We have our own golden calf that distracted us from God. God punished them, but did not destroy them. Build a tabernacle to the, in, in the promised land. So, just like the pastor said something, I want, the reason you're brought here in Apple Valley is that there is a plan for you, that you will be a part of our vision here. So what I'm gonna do is, I would like to have somebody um, give out this one. This is our fundraising request. Now, if you have the heart and God will touch your heart, it may be not now, but you can give it to relatives who are rich for you. Remember the the, um, the widow who only gave one cent to his, her mind and gave everything. So if you want to be a part, God said, build me a tabernacle. And he told Solomon, build me a what? A temple. So what happened to the Israelites? They were blessed. So because we do not have a place here, by the way, there is no SDA church in Apple Valley. Okay, um, this is a place where our great need is. So that's why God brought you here. Now, Brother William, whether it be Sister Maxine, there is a reason for you and Renisha and all of you, Laura over there, there is a, a reason why God brought you here. Because we are the pioneers that would build a church and one day see the church so that the community will know who we are. And when you build it, people will come. All right, so uh, can I hear amen? amen? Yes, because that is one big undertaking. And so was the Israelite in the desert to build a tabernacle in the middle of nothing, but there they were able to build a tabernacle for them. Likewise, Solomon built uh, the temple and the Israelites were built. So, um, I mean, we're blessed so much. So that is the main theme of the journey. So how can you relate to the journey of, of the Israelites to our time? I'm sure you can, in, in the moment of your life, you can always remember how he tried you, how he uh, put you to your knee, and how he made you cry so that you will remember and you will return to him. Because we falter a lot, we are sinful. But why did God bring them to the holy mountain? But yet it was called Mount Sin, Mount Sinai. Um, so that is one of our goal here. So I hope even one cent, ten cent, a hundred, one thousand, you can bring it here so one day we can build that tabernacle. 
or God. Okay, and on top of that, this will end um, soon. Promises on this corner, what do you think are our promises? So I put, I pull out what Psalms had said. I am the living water. Basic need of a person is air and water, right? We will not live if we don't have water. And can you imagine looking into the desert where we were? We traveled about six to seven hours from Cairo to Goshen. It was so dry, except for Goshen was, there was a lot of water. And he is the living water. God hopefully will not deprive us of water. And it would be a living water, not bitter water of Rephidim, but the living water of Kadesh Barnea. I will supply your needs, you know that. Basically, you know, when you're down to your last, what happened? He will come through for you. Believe me. Okay. All right. Here again. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen you and uphold you. He knows our beginning to the end. And then I am the beginning to the end. And then for the redemption part. What does that journey really mean? It's about submission. At the time when they don't know, where's the water, Moses? What are we going to eat? How are we going to survive with this heat? Well, it's all about submission. Where God, and in, in, in the verses from 1 to 20, it said, I will be with you like an eagle, right? In eagles, uh, the wings of eagles. Now, do you know what the highest acuity of an eagle's eye? He can see a little squirrel down there. He can stoop from above and soup that little squirrel. It has one of the best, that's why eagle's eye is one of the best acuity in sight. Humility and trust. Sometimes we're so in a hurry and we take things in our own hand, right? Remember uh, Abraham and Sarah? Oh, you will be my sister. I will, you know, he, he made that decision instead of waiting. Uh, so he said to the other lady, uh, Sarah said, you can have your offspring from who? Hagar. Yes, Hagar. So sometimes when you take things in our own hands, we mess it up. And so we just need to what? Trust. Faithfulness and patience. Can we be patient? And I look at that desert and I thought, God, I would grumble too. I would murmur too if I lived in this desert. Because I tell you, I see problems. Once in a while, maybe 10, 20 miles, there is a gas station where you can get soft drinks and juices but it was so arid that I thought how did Moses walk and the Israelites walk and even um, Joshua to get to the promised land forgiveness right God showed forgiveness in spite of the hardening of our hearts and we know that we are stubborn and we keep repeating things because what the Bible says is that the things that I do not want to do what I do it so it is that forgiveness that is like a cycle that God will never uh, leave us alone and He will not be giving us that message that, oh, you're hopeless. The Israelites were hopeless. They were so disobedient. Dependence, right? And a compass. Somebody open Exodus, Exodus 13, 21. Are your Bibles in front of you? What does a compass mean? Uh, Exodus 13, 21, anybody wants to read? Well, let's read that together. Meaning, I know your beginning and the end. I know what is best for you, in spite of the fact that I will let you stay in that desert and let you suffer from the heat and from your dismay and for little what you can have. So Exodus 13, 21, anybody wants to stand and read that please for me? And the Lord went before them day by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. Yeah. From the beginning to the end they had the light. He was guiding them. So that's the way he said, look here guys, I am here. If you see the light and the pillar, I am here, I am with you. Okay, and there's a verse. The Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud 
and fire to give the light. Somebody guess what GPS means? What's a GPS? Aha! Uh -huh. Thank you! GPS is Global Positioning System. He knows where you are. You know, who do we depend for GPS system nowadays? Aha! Uh -huh. Here. And sometimes this becomes our idol because everything we look here, we're so busy. I'm guilty of that too. I call it God's pilot system, right? He knows where you're at. He knows where to bring you. If you are lost, you know, Google, God is patient. Likewise, Google. When you're lost, what does Google say? Reroute, reroute, reroute. He does, she doesn't say it. It's a lady. She will say to you, reroute, reroute. It doesn't say to you, hey, dummy, I told you to turn right. But you turn left. Stay on the right of the fork, not on the left. We get lost still here, right? This is our GPS and we connect this to our phone. Yes, very much so. We depend on that. But God's pilot system. So our prayer today is that, Lord, where will you take me? Can I see the promised land? Thank you for what you have been for me from the start. When I was born, you knew me. And where you have brought me as a migrant here, all of us have our sufferings here. You know, when I arrived here, uh, I did not pass my board yet. I was only having three to five dollars per hour. Can you imagine? Brother Jack, only three to five dollars per hour. And I thought, oh, okay, how can we survive this? Anyhow, we did. But God's pilot system knows where to lead you. I never thought I would end up in Nova Linda. I never thought I would be in the desert which I grumbled, Lord, why did you bring me here? Well, my uncle brought me here. That's why I'm here. But I now I know why, because it was our family that started this small church. Anyhow, he is leading us to heaven, our promised land. So that is our final destination. This is not our final destination. We are only migrants. We are just moving from place to place. We are not immigrants, because if you're an immigrant, you're here and you're stuck. So, uh, finally, um, I hope that Exodus journey, which actually enlightened me and said, Lord, thank you for what you have shown me. Because now I can only trust you. I don't know where my life will end. I don't know what you have for me. But here's what. While we're here, we need to do something great. And our challenge is this. How can we show love to our family? I know of a child whose dad was a pastor, and you know what he said? My dad is so strict, I cannot feel love, now I'm not SDA. Okay? So, how are you dealing with your family? Yes, there are challenges among your family. A child, a son who is not an SDA, a spouse who is not an SDA. Just know that he is there, and he will not leave you, because even People who have left and strayed, who became just like the prodigal son, who became a drunkard, or whatever, uh, the drugs, they come back. And so he knows where to place us. And our final prayer is where? To bring us to that promised land in heaven. So if you read Exodus 1 to 20, that is where all this happened. And, um, I hope that, uh, that you, we all know that he is our GPS. So next time you see this, offer a prayer first and not depend on, on the phone. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you so much that we could learn from the Israelites. And yet, Lord, we are in our own wanderings in this earth, which is almost to finish, and that we, we know that you're almost here to come and take us home. One day we will be free of war, be free of all this pestilence and also what you said in Revelation 16, that you will deliver us in spite of the seven bowls, that the waters will turn into like sun and blood and all that, and you will deliver us from all these uh, trials and temptations and our unfaithfulness. Take us home, Lord. We have been waiting for you. So, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.